episode of your Technology Questions Answered. I am your host, Steve Smith, a.k.a. Z-Axis, and we are May 22nd, 2011. And if any of you have gone to my website lately and actually previewed the episodes coming up next, or have listened to last episode, you know that today, episode 34, is all about scanning for Windows viruses from Linux. More specifically, Ubuntu 11.04. But before we get to any of that, I have a personal request of you. Please head over to my website, www.cedaxis.net. Go to the podcast bookmark on the left. Click the listener survey. Take five minutes. Fill it out, even anonymously if you want. Tell me what you think of the show. Comments, suggestions, Anything pertinent to that survey, fill it out. I thank you in advance. It will help me make my show better so that more of you can actually learn about how to keep your computer safe, functional, and working awesomely. So let's go back to the actual topic of the day. Why we should scan our Windows machine from Linux for viruses why is it that we are actually forced to do so in some cases? And what is it about Windows and other operating systems that makes doing it from within the operating system a painstaking, irritating movement of action that should have never happened? First of all, at the very beginning, people making viruses were making viruses for hell making viruses. So you got things like ping pong virus and a bunch of annoying other types of viruses that are just basically people having fun. No person, no particular harm to the computer. Not even a chance of fraud occurring. Later on, certain sets of people, which are now growing by the day, figured out they can make money off of this. This is the birth of the actual terrible virus. The virus that actually damages your computer. In more ways than just physical, it does damage the software. Sometimes not even damaging the computer, but more like turning a computer into a great big lighthouse beacon of information being used to target other places and all that. So, what does this mean for the user? Well, somewhere along the line, the operating system companies decided to do something which would have been completely and utterly awesome if actually applied correctly. It is called file locking. Now, let's explain something about this. File locking in its most theoretical point of view means that nothing about that file should ever be able to be deleted, replaced, and or modified, which would make it great because that would render it immune against viruses. Unfortunately, in practice, that's not at all true. That's actually completely and utterly false. Just like any other thing ever created to protect other people from certain types of stuff, like the DVD with the anti-piracy encoding on it that still gets pirated, by the way, automatically now, the file locking has been defeated by the hacker, not by the user. So even though the user can't suppress the infected file, and neither can the antivirus program, the virus programmer can modify it all he wants. He can make that file completely delete your operating system, just like he can make that file push out all your personal information into the great beyond of the internet, where you get your identity stolen. So why is it that I actually want you to scan for Windows viruses from Linux? Well, even though that file is being protected for a very specific reason, if you deleted it, your computer may cease to exist, you still want to get rid of that file because it's infected. And that file, since it is a system file, still has a copy of the original clean version on your installation disk. So what do you do? Go to another operating system, suppress the hell out of that file, use the recovery mode on your disk, and put back a clean version of the file. That's it. That's all I basically want you to do. You have an infected system file. I'm giving you 
the ability to bypass, just like the hacker, the file locking system designed to protect your operating system, but allowing you to protect yourself. So, when I go into this demonstration, please keep in mind a few things. This is a list of objects you need. One, a calm environment, just breathe. You'll be fine. As long as you did backups, there's nothing you can do to you on this computer that is not reversible. Two, please get yourself something to write on with a writing instrument, a pen, pencil, I don't care. You can write it in blood. Just as long as you write down the name of the files and where you deleted them from before you suppress the hell out of them. And make sure you have a recovery disk now if you don't borrow one for the most part Windows doesn't care if it's your disk or your neighbors disk they care if you're using a copy of Windows illegally like my laptop I don't actually natively have a Windows disk I have a recovery disk which does come with the recovery console anyway but I can borrow anybody's Windows disk that is matching mine and use the recovery console as long as my serial number is unique and mine. So don't worry about any copyright infringement. None is being done today. So, again, paper, pen or pencil or blood doesn't matter just as long as you can write anything down. And the disk designed to recover your computer. More specifically, the recovery console for Windows. Now, let's get on to the demonstration. So all you need to do is access applications, open up the installed, scroll down, Ubuntu Software Center, type in the word virus so you can find a file, virus scanner, click install, enter your password, click more information, just make sure that the Microsoft cabinet files thing is actually installed. It is in our case. Let's just let this finish. It's actually pretty fast. Close that. Now open up the applications again. Open up installed. Go all the way to the bottom. That's where it's going to be. Open up virus scanner. Now folks, this is what it looks like. I know it's very simple, but don't worry about it. At the top, click Advanced, go to Preferences, make sure scan all files and directories within a directory is on, enable extra scanning, and files larger than 20 megs are all on. Click Scan Directory, go into the file system, select Host, and hit OK. At this point, you're pretty sure that it's going to scan. So, while we wait, there, it's now loading. You've now scanned your Windows partition for the first time in history. Now, we're not going to complete it right here since it would take a while. But, once it's finished, if you have no viruses, it's just going to say it's clean. If you do, it'll tell you how to uninstall or delete the virus-infected files. So, as you've just seen, very easy to use. ClamTK virus scanner, very easy to tinker with, very easy to get working and scanning and by the way even though we don't actually show you it very easy to get rid of viruses too just make sure you write down the name of the file that was infected where it was located and check to see if it is a system file that will prevent you from starting a computer or just a file from something else make sure you get it from the recovery mode of the disk the recovery console and copy a brand new version of that file onto your hard drive and you should be fine there's nothing that you've done that is irreversible Windows is just made this way sorry but that's the way it is so besides that I do have a few suggestions for you one image backups aka a high-speed recovery method something I will show later on you do this by actually copying all the bits of data on the hard drive onto another hard drive, making it extremely fast to recover your computer in the case of infection or a program misbehaving and crashing your Windows permanently. That I'll actually show you how to get working. Then you also have backup of your files. Now you do need three backups, 
two in-house minimum, one external minimum. I can actually save you the trouble of all of that all in one package. Do you have more than one computer? Yes, you do, probably. Let's solve multiple issues. You want to be able to access your file anywhere in the world. You want to be able to access it on any mobile phone. You need synchronized copies for your home and office. You want to be able to get that file on your computer and on your other computer in your house and on your cell phone. What do you do? Yes, it's sounding redundant. Get this. It's redundant. It synchronizes the files. So, Dropbox.com. Installed on one computer, two computers, three computers, any amount of computers. So let's say you got two computers, you install on both computers. What happens? Okay, first computer, you save it into the Dropbox folder. You start modifying this file in the Dropbox folder. You hit save. You close the computer. After it synchronizes, you go to the next computer. It's synchronized there. You continue writing on this file. It's already saved in two places. You following me yet? Not yet? Okay, how about, that? How about this? You've got two copies already. But while it's synchronizing, keep in mind, there is a copy of this file in the cloud. So let's say the whole city floods. By the way, not that far away from me, they're actually cities flooded. So it's not a long shot. You, even if the city floods, that copy of the file is saved to the internet. And get this, the most important thing that needs to be done is, if I have that file saved, can I still access it from everywhere, anywhere? And the answer is yes. All you need to do is access that file on your iPhone, Blackberry, or, other, or any other device from any device that can either download their actual software designed for your smartphone or any other device that actually has a mobile web browser or a standard web browser. You can access the file anywhere. So the second thing was make a backup and that's made very easily by using the Dropbox.com application which I'm actually using right now for the podcast. Now, the third thing you should do, save a copy of the registry. Now, most of you have never done it. I've done it plenty of times. Modifying and fixing registry, painstaking, irritating, actually uh, time-consuming work that should never be done. All you should have done in the first place is export the registry after you finished installing all your applications you wanted and save it to any USB or a disk that you want. That way, if it ever got infected, all you need to do is re-import it over the current registry. This makes your life easier. Only the applications installed after need to be reinstalled. Saves you and me a lot of trouble if you just do that. So, image backups I'll be talking about in the future. Next week, I'll be talking about how to disable and remove, one or the other, the Unity toolbar. That graphic user interface, which I believe is made by a blind person trying to use a GPS. Yeah, that thing. We're going to get rid of it and show you how to get rid of it permanently and not so permanently. This way, you can actually figure out what you're trying to do in the operating system. Later on, I'll show you how to install an application that will make that interface more like a Macintosh, making it even easier to use the Ubuntu software and giving you an even better user experience. So until next week, stay safe and online. Don't forget to subscribe to my show. Thank you all in advance for doing my survey at www.zedaxis.net. Have a great weekend and goodbye.